Casey booth back there yes, and they, sir. they've got all kinds of stuff going on I think if you buy one you know, maybe an engraved knife something yep. like that with the purchase as long as they last and you're uh, you're back there answering questions as well but uh, y'all come up here and join us uh, rest your feet a little bit we're gonna do a little Q&A right here but uh, John I'll let you take it away buddy all right appreciate it. thank Thanks. you um, on our new ropes our rope smart steer is what we call it. we call it one smart dummy um, when we were working on this last four years before we released it we didn't want to bring a dummy to the market that was just something else to exercise on that we could say looks like a cow, shaped like a cow, smells like a cow, but it's plastic and we could still throw every bad loop known to man on it. And I want to set something straight up from the beginning. You know, I didn't come from the top end the elite and try to somehow learn to verbalize my talents. What it was is I was a very challenged roper, very determined, um, driven to be successful and consistent. And no matter what I did, there was a ceiling that I always hit. And those inconsistencies, I'd say I'd catch 90%. Well, when that 10% shows up in the short go for big money, it was quite inspirational on the way home when you're thinking, wow, I just waved it off for 10 grand. That's just sickening, you know? I mean, just, just frustrated as all could get out. But I'd go back home and had my dummy, had my sawhorse, and just wear it out till my shoulder hurt so bad I could hardly swing my rope. And never had any real change and um, so being in the photography and video industry is what I was in at that time I had uh, it's just funny how I ended up in there after the Air Force um, and um, I thought you know what I'm gonna study these guys I've got the decks I've got where I can slow this stuff down to snail's pace I've got the big screen I can put it on and I'm gonna start watching the BFI's the George Straits the average ropings I'm gonna look all these things over and um, I just started really watching tons and tons of footage and measuring things and looking at distances and angles and everything else. And much like if I ask everybody sitting right here to look up that sign up there, and how many people even noticed the sign was above them before I pointed out? Nobody. But also, just like watching these team roping runs, there's a lot I've just never seen, but over time studying it, you start seeing this common denominator in all these guys. And once you learn to see these common denominators, they stick out like a sore thumb. So when I'm working with somebody, or myself for that sake, and I see one of these flaws or something else, it stands out like a sore thumb to me. And so we went through all those and really looked at what made these guys great and how they were so similar. And then we wanted to develop a dummy that helped us find that loop. And like I said, just finding something out of thin air, you know, a guy who swung like this his whole life, trying to find out of thin air how to teach him to get turned over and roll his hand, get his thumb down, and blossom his loop, you think it would seem easy. You think you'd just say it and you would do it. But how many times have somebody said, you're roping like this, you're roping like that, you're doing this, you're doing that, and you just can't, you can't, you can't find it. And so on this dummy, um, it, every angle, every shape was built and designed with a purpose. Um, it ended up to me looking pretty cool when we finished up with it. Um, I told my buddy, I said, man, it looks like I'm making a roping crotch rocket motorcycle. Got a gas tank and a back flare and grab the, grab the horns and I'm off to the races. But it, it really, everything's designed for a purpose on this. There's nothing that was just haphazard. Um, and so I want to start with the most obvious thing that everybody asks about. Obviously, it's that it's got horns. Um, no, it's the post. Everybody asks me, and I've answered this question, if I had a quarter for every time I've had to describe what the post is for, man, it'd be great. I wouldn't have to sell dummies. I'd just sit here and answer questions about the post. But the deal is this. The biggest misses in team roping are what? Split horns wave offs, and if you're a high numbered guy, pushes where you weld it on the back of the head. Um, or if a guy is pretty decent and he gets a great steer, gets at him quick and he throws it down side the head. Um, those, those misses are huge in team roping. And we can go to any number, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 15, and we will see those loops. We've seen it in the pros. Three nights ago, we saw several guys deliver just, I mean, a fraction of a degree early. And when you're off one degree at 20 feet, you're off a lot at 20 feet. At your hand, it was just a degree or two. But 20 feet's a lot. And those small differences are what makes us miss. And so this post, one of the things it does is it keeps us from being able to just throw these loops that we'd wipe on. You're not gonna catch the post in both horns with that loop. 
And when we think about our target plane, a guy who's always roped with this much opening in his loop, and he can catch, say, 90% of his cattle. The second that cow does this, that's a miss. The second it comes around flat and the steer's head's low, he's going to hit the shoulder, and how many of those are going to open up and wave off? So on our dummy, we didn't want a head that stuck up and said, here, please rope me, or a long, skinny neck that gave me a huge opening and a sloped shoulder where the rope would slide up over the back. We wanted something that would challenge us and make sure that we had our loop open. So the post, obviously, if I'm going to catch the right horn to catch the left, you have to have your loop open to come across. And that loop, when we're roping with the center part of this loop, and if you watch a great head loop go on, I mean, their thumb is down when they're swinging. They have to turn their hand over to get the bottom strand of the base of the right horn. And when they extend and they open that palm and get here, they roll. And when we're up close, I mean, obviously, we still got to get across the horns. I can't say I'm throwing right at the back of the head and catch both horns. This isn't throwing a Chinese star. We're not trying to say throw down on top of the horns. It is getting this loop open so our target and our loop, our area we can catch with is this big. And I think everybody would agree that that's a much bigger opening than this. Okay. Also, when we have that big open to the middle of the horns, we can rope as big a horn as we want. The width of horns has no determining factor on how we deliver, other than we have to come what? around the base of the right horn. If your loop is, I mean, you could have a three foot right horn, when it comes around and hits it, it's gonna come over on the other side. You're swinging in a circle, or it should be, and your shoulder's back, or it should be, and so when you rotate and carry it past the center of that head, you'll catch both horns. When people drop their loop early, is usually what causes splits. There's a couple things, but that's the most common. They'll be swinging everything and be look good, and they'll deliver just right there, and it's going to, if it catches the right horn, it'll come back around and come underneath. But you notice how my loop kicked all the way over there? When my loop finishes flying, hits into my slack, and hits my spoke, it kicks right to left. I can't stop it unless I don't use any spoke. And none of us are going to go out there and rope with this. Imbalance, no kick, dead loop, no catching machine right here. So throwing a flat loop on this isn't going to work. Delivering early isn't going to work. And if we're a top guy and you're trying to go really, really, really fast, and they've got to be so perfect, they get going like this real fast, and they, it's like, wow, imperfection starts showing up. Things don't work so perfectly. And so this dummy, when you have something that's really fast and imperfect, there's going to be flaws. And so the top guys, they sit back there, and when they're just down and stand down in it, they rope really, really good. But when they start pushing it, they start u bolting the back of the head. Now, the other thing I wanted to do with the post is to make sure it gave me a reference of where to stand and also kept me roping in the center of my loop. If my loop was to open up past this post, my buildup's too big, now I'm trying to rope in the back part of my loop. What is the biggest part of this circle? Front, back, or center? So the buildup has to be correct as well. So a guy that's sitting here in his chance, and he keeps missing going around the front of the post, going around the front of the post, he's gonna do one of two things. He's either gonna shorten stuff up, or he's gonna back off a little bit, to when that loop opens, it's in the middle of the loop, catches both horns. So it helps with the buildup. But the thing we visually did is we wanted to have something that'll tell us where to stand on the ground. How many people do you see just right here walk forward and back on their dummy and just weld it on, take the loop off, they come back, they get back here, they get going, and they just weld it on? If we rope forward and back like this on horseback, our shoulders are here, our target's there, I've got this much coverage. If I move over here, now my shoulders are here and I've got that much coverage. A whole lot more coverage, as well as a whole lot more power. How much more power will I have from back here versus up here? A lot more. The other thing it does is where's my left hand when I'm up here close and I rope and pull my slack? Why do we see low numbered guys that rope in narrow have problems controlling their head horse? And nine times out of 10, they're looking at getting a dally and then looking back because the steer's already behind them. So we move over here left too, it opens our shoulders, but it also puts us in arm wrestling position. We can create a wall right here with our left hand, and when we rope this dummy, we can rope, and you've got a wall to stand your horse up against. And so the foundation that we built from roping on the ground, we wanted this to transfer to horseback and be real. Not just something where it starts to say, you need to rope live cows, because roping a dummy is not the same. This will make you rope like you're on horseback. The other thing that this post does, we line it out, is it puts us in the right line to make this arc of the shoulder create a small window under here. And when I turn this around, I want everybody to look to the top of that shoulder, 
to the base of the right horn and see how big that opening is from where you're at. Any bow hunters in here? Anybody bow hunt? Raise your hand if you bow hunt. I see one, two. Anybody else bow hunt? Three. You ever heard the term aim small, miss small? What happens if you're floating your sight pin all over the rib cage of a deer? You have no idea where you're going to hit him. When you're roping a dummy, if you can throw any old loop up there and hit it, and if I'm shooting at a bow target from right here, I don't need a sight. I can hit it. You put somebody back at 40 yards, and you tell them you want it in a four-inch circle, how tight and how accurate do they need to be? You make any little fudge from 40 yards back, what happens? Not a small miss, but a giant miss. So on this shoulder in the base of that horn, I wanted something that as I backed him got here, that's going to make my tip get down. I'm going to have to look at the base of that right horn. I'm going to have to get my tip down. And I want to make sure I go down deep enough to get around the base of the right horn. Okay? So on the drop in the loop, where do you think drop in your loop is going to help you? How's my loop if I'm swinging down here? How far can I get that angle to the base of the right horn? I'd have to be right here wiping it on to get it under the base of the right horn. When I get back a coil or two, hit the middle of the steer's back, flop there in the back, and it's just going to fall off. Ain't going to work. So a guy who maybe doesn't want to reach, but when you need to, that loop you've now developed gives you the ability to drop a coil effortlessly. You've got the right angle, the right plane. This position, when we rope out wide, we talked about how it helps us, you know, shape a steer, hold our horse in there, better coverage. I want you guys to see what happens here when we're in narrow and we're out wide. So one of you guys... That's sitting here. I need somebody just to come up here and hold this rope for me. So on the ground, you're standing in there, and that's about three foot. How many of you ever heard, stay about three foot off the steer's hip? Sound like a common term, pretty average what most people say, right? When we're about three foot off the steer's hip, this is what we see. Now I want you to walk left. There's a dead spot, and now you're what? You're dragging a steer, okay? Is it best to drag or what, what, is it, what is it called? What do we want to do to this here? We want to what? Starts with an H. Handle a steer. How do you handle something that you're dragging? Or that you gave a chance to put his back feet in the ground and not only take your horse one shot here, but then another shot when he gets out wide. And if you're roping from in here and you wonder why your head horse starts not scoring great, getting squirrely in the box, well, you're sitting there taking him, taking him, going bam, hitting him once, bam, hitting him twice, and then he's dragging a steer that's got his feet in the ground and that's not great for the withers, the hawks, or anything. Definitely not mental composure. So you step out there to a 45, make sure your rope lines up with the post. Well, that's a lot more than a 45. If you were up there, you'd be having problems too. Look at the post on the base of the right horn. It tells you where to go, it gives you a reference. When you sit down and you rope from here and you sit down and just go to the peg and you check your horse, the steer does this. Oh, wow. It's amazing. You know what else it is? It's amazingly easy on your horse. Think of this, how many of y'all here have kids? How many of you kids used to like to be swung in a swing? Okay, if somebody walked up behind your kid in a swing and said, oh, you wanna swing, little kid? Picked him up, went like this, and dropped him. Uh, they wouldn't be asking to be swung again, and you'd probably wanna be beating the person up that just did it to your kid. But you'd do it to your head horse, get in there and rope one and wham, hit him. But when we pick that kid up on the swing and we go like this, bring him back and let him go, what does the kid do? Swings on his own. So why does it surprise us that we can give such a beautiful handle from right here? When we can stick a steer, I'm on the ground, my dummy tells me right here, I'm learning this visually, shaping my loops from here, mechanics are from here, everything's great, and I go out and I teach my horse to run to this spot. All of a sudden I start winning more, my horse is acting better, my loops are better, my range is better, my coverage is better, the, the base of the horn, all these things add together to make you a complete package. Okay, and then what I do, thank you very much. And then what I do is I challenge myself. I don't just practice the free throw shot. We designed a dummy that you can change things up and practice more than one loop. So let's get this off here real quick. So I take it off. And today at Horseman's Park, my partner and I got a steer just like that. Had a broken horn rolled to the front. In fact, his horn had been broke. It was like this. And he was ducking to the fence, cut us off. How hard do you think it was to rope that cow? That is the hardest roping team roping. That's the hardest steer to catch. And it um, didn't work out. He couldn't get him off the wall. We couldn't get him caught. How many times do we get a steer that rolls at us like this? 
comes out and all your buddies are sitting over here hooting and hollering as you shave off the flag man you're around the corner steers coming to you you got to change the plane of your loop but your delivery has to be perfect you have to get past the center of the head or you won't catch that left horn your loop will hit right here and do a 360 and off it'll go okay and about that time you hear the announcer go everybody out of the arena give everybody a fair chance please except for the last guy and everybody has to get out of the way well just screwed you if you would have worked this and been able to finish that loop, you could have went off and leave, gave your healer a chance. So practicing these different shots, different positions to maintain that body position and still roll past the center of the horn before you roll your hand over, it is huge. No professional athlete would go to the basketball court and shoot free throws or go to the batting cage and hit a little league pitcher. You have to change stuff up. You have to make it difficult. You have to make yourself well-rounded. So when you're in the heat of competition, do we think or do we want to react? What do you want to do? You want to think about the shot or do you want to just react? And speaking of that, one of the other drills I like to do, if I walk up here and I ride my horse up here and I think about it and rope three or four, three or four swings and go to deliver, what does that do to our head loops usually? Yeah, they're, huge. they're horrible. Our shoulders start closing up. We start creeping. You're getting outrun by a steer. It's so funny watching these guys say, oh, my horse is too slow. You're getting outrun by a steer, and this horse is just blazing up there, and it gets one coil away and rates. And they're like, man, he just quit running. He outrun me. Well, no, if you lean forward, your head horse is usually going to rate off. And he's going to quit running, and you're going to be that same distance the rest of the way up the pin, and then you're having no power, no nothing, and you're having to try to reach to catch him before he goes in the strip and shoot. So this is a drill I do with this dummy as well that helps me get ready to rope as I approach a steer, not give up my body mechanics, any of that. Come on up here real quick. Yep. I want you to get yourself set up over here in a good position to rope. Get your base, everything. Show me exactly how you'd rope. Okay. Right foot forward, left foot back. Tell me exactly. Just throw us a loop. Let's check this out. Okay. All right. Good start for a game of pig. Now, I want everybody to look at his feet. This is huge, and when we're on the ground walking back and forth, you should understand that when we do that, we're giving up a ton of power, a ton of our lower body, and this is just, just to prove the point. Step your left foot forward this time. Turn your shoulder in mind and push. Push. Step your left foot forward. Push, push, push. What foot are you pushing on? Okay, so if your power is in your right foot, even though in your left lead on your horse, why should it surprise you that you're going to throw a weaker loop on the ground? If you blow your right stirrup going out the box, how easy is it to throw your head loop? That is your power foot, your right foot. So if you walk and step up here, well, what did I just give up? Wow, I just uncocked my hips, my torso. And most of the power we have on horseback, we have to create in our hips and our upper body, much like a golfer. Golfer's got to have power on the inside of his right foot. He's got to engage his hips, twist up here, just like if he had a swell in front of him, push it on that, and when he uncocks, he's got power into his back shoulders and his, and, and his swing. Just like Tiger Woods, why can he hit a 300-yard drive? He doesn't step into it like a baseball pitcher. He twists his hips and locks up every muscle from here to here. Not in his arms. It's the power in our torso. So when you're roping the dummy, first thing I'd say is this. Get in a realistic position and make sure that you are just like you'd ride your horse. And you can twist your shoulders back and get ready. Bend your knees a little bit, hence our stirrup swing. And if you think this is a joke, seriously, go home, take your right foot out of the right stirrup and right out of the box. Better yet, jump in the bed of a pickup truck, have somebody drive in a left-hand circle, and see which way you lean. If you lean out on your right foot, you're going out the bed of the truck. If you lean on your left foot but support with your right, you're just going to ride in a circle, much like steering a motorcycle. Any of y'all ever rode a motorcycle? When you're leaning like this and turning, going to the right is not an option. You have to be up straight. Okay, head horse is in his left lead. Okay, so get everything ready just like that. Get your arm back. Get your lube built. Now this drill we do is the steer approaches us and to be ready when it gets there so we don't think about it. And again, I'll tip the horns, tip them right, tip them left, position, speed. I'll mark the floor for my buddy so I know that I'm not going to pull it back too close like my horse went too far. I want him in this sweet spot and I'll get back here and he's going to nod and go to swinging. And he should be swinging like he means it. And when the steer gets there, I rate him off. And so this drill right here, I do this over and over again. This gives me the mental ability to get ready, get ready, get ready. As he gets there, use him. We saw a header the other night at the NFR. got up there, swung a few times, swung a few times. It made me sick because I was cheering for him. And then, whew, right, missed the right horn. Totally missed it. So our bottom mechanics using this dummy for these drills is huge. Let's try it one more time, okay? 
Get a good size loop built up, something you could reach it with. Another thing, when you're roping this, kids ropes, they're fun to play with everything else, but if you want real change in this thing, you should be using a full size rope, full size loop. Okay, get it fed, get everything going. Okay, we see where he was at there. That loop probably was gonna work, except for one thing. He threw front to back, but more importantly, this was his loop. Honda hit back here, loop came out like here. If he would have had a shorter piece of slack in his hand, the loop, the horns would have been in the middle of the loop, it would have curled, and he would have had a catch. So again, your range and your buildup. This is great for any numbered roper, especially beginners. All right, so thank you very much. I'll bring you back up here in a minute. So the last thing we did here on the head side is we wanted a dummy to do what? It would be a universal dummy for everybody in the family. We got girls at calf rope, kids at calf rope, breakaway tie down. And so we wanted to make sure if they buy the dummy, they could add on a calf head and rope everything. So we developed a calf head, which I believe to be the best calf head in the industry. And the reason being is unlike a hay bale that will grab our rope or carpet or foam or anything else, this dummy right here doesn't grab anything. And if you do not have your tip down on this calf, you will not rope this calf. If your loop opens up towards the back of the head, you will not rope this calf, period. It will skip off just like you're skipping a rock on water. And how many kids do we see, especially if they're team roping too, go out and top knot a calf? The calves that stick their head up, easy to rope, they're easy to rope. How many calves that are running hard, just like steers, stick their head up? They run their head down and out. So kid comes in here and gets everything going. He's got good tip. Wow, it opened up at the back of the ears. That didn't look so good. We've seen a couple loops hit the back of the ears this week. And these guys are magicians stepping off, holding their slack, feeding, and then getting it. It's just crazy to watch them. But they are naturally talented. Those are things that you can't, you got to learn fundamentals. And then your natural talent will take you to where it'll take you. Okay? So having a calf head on there makes it a universal dummy. Good for everybody in the family. So let's go back and talk about the back feet. One of the cool things about this too is I got tired of dummies taking up space in my trailer and everything else, trying to pack them up on top. I got, it took so long to get them up on top of a trailer, you never wanted to take them down. This dummy collapses, folds all the way up, the heads all go inside, the legs go forward, and you actually get to store a rope on each side to so keep your dummy ropes on your dummy. But the cool thing is, we made it to where you can just drop your tailgate when you're hooked up to your fifth wheel, slide it up on your tailgate, put it underneath your hitch, and close the door. Goes with the ever, easy to access, easy to, easy to pack around. So let's move on to the back feet. And I'll, anybody has any questions on the head before I move on? About the pole, jamming loops, flat loops, or delivering early? Anybody have any questions on that? Or position, where to rope from and why to rope from here? Good, all right. The back feet were the most challenging thing and the most Oh, I guess complexing thing to design. So, so much in physics plays a part in how a heel loop works. Um, you, can, you can teach some guy to swing. You can tell him how to swing. You can't teach him. You can't say, you'll find your tip when you do this. Centrifugal force cannot be seen. And so in studying this and watching all the greats and their angles and deliveries and everything else and the size of a loop that would fit through that little opening, you know, you don't want to walk up to this with a goat rope again or something like that and sit here and just... You know, I can do that all day long. What does that do to my loop? What does that do to my delivery? Is that healthy for me? Is that good for my roping? No. When I take a full-size loop that's really big, you know, I think about a heel loop, and I got to get to that little opening. If I get up here and everything looks good, feels good, but I get my hand first, wow, total rejection. However, look how much of that tips right there. Would that have not gone right through a sawhorse? Swept right through and stood up and looked great. I hate to say it, but we don't heel off Shetland ponies. If we did, we could swing down here, we could swing flat like that and try to get it underneath the steer's belly. That's not how we heel. We're up here looking down at a cow, and those angles play a huge part of it, and our tip going in first is everything. And so a guy that's got good tip control can build a full-size loop, and he's going to be able to get it in this opening. A guy that loses his loop, loses his tip, can't find it, goes around, he starts swatting legs on the outside or missing steers, he comes around, gets high, Wow, holding my hand out here, does that do anything good for my delivery being high? All this rope sitting out here? No. But on a sawhorse, I learned to make those things work. I'd get up here on a sawhorse, swing up flat above the sawhorse, get like this, pull my back, and throw that loop. 
that doesn't do anything on a live cow. You take that on a live cow, if you catch a few, and a few makes you happy, it's just a bad deal. It just doesn't do it for you. The other thing, I started opening the back side of a sawhorse, like behind it. I steepened my loop so I wasn't flat transitioning. I got down here, get like this, then I would step into it and do the same thing. Close my hips, hold my thumb, and let it sweep through. What about a heel runner in delivery has anything about closing a distance? Or is it not complete separation as we deliver? So the last thing I want to do is teach myself to step on my right foot when I deliver my heel loop. What I saw myself doing in video when I practiced this, hand would hold out here, left hand was way out of control, turning my, head, my heel horse sideways. Better yet, it was shutting him down. Step my foot on the right stirrup, he shut down. If a horse can feel a fly land on his butt, what makes me think that 190 pounds shifting from here to here, he's not gonna feel? And how many guys then, hence, whip the crap out of their horse, he shorted me, go down the pen and you're like going, well, maybe he wouldn't have shorted you if you weren't like peeking over like you're trying to see underneath the belly, see what sex he was or something. I mean, seriously. We see guys lean like that all the time. It's like, sit up and your horse can run. When you shift your weight and your delivery, he's gonna stop. That's a huge cue, okay? The other thing I wanted to do here, like we have this visual reference of where to stand, so we're out at a 45 here. I wanted to make sure that when I was going down the pin as a healer, let me move this over here, so I don't get too far out of camera. But I'm out over here, and when I leave the heel box, my steer's running that way, where do we start our heel up? Where does it point? Are we swinging flat like we were above the sawhorse? Are we swinging down here like we're swinging behind the sawhorse? No, when we leave the box and we start out, our shoulders turn back to him and we're like this. We're up here, we're looking down to the steer. So we studied all these angles from the front of the arena this way. We thought we need something on the ground to make us a reference there because a lot of people don't naturally swing there on the ground. Okay, again, we're trying to rope from the ground like we would on horseback. Let it transfer. So I made that top angle, that leg. I could have chose any angle. We took an average and made sure that when I looked at it from a distance, my loop was an extension of that angle. And so here on the ground, I've got something to look at that's going to help me go from here to here to here to here. And then when I go forward, notice I don't step on my right foot. I go in like this, I keep my shoulder back, and then I change the plane of my swing over the back, over the back, and extend through. Now notice I rotated my shoulders to catch, and I was able to go right off the swing into my delivery. And when we can come right off our swing into our delivery, we don't change anything. We ride great position, and we lean forward, and we deliver. So this angle here, we cut it out and dropped it down. So I could hence aim at my target, not above it, not behind it, not having to peek over, and definitely not something I could deliver flat on. I wanted something to be clean and realistic. Just like today, we drew a steer that the guy grabbed the first one, whew, jerked it, and he was gone. He was screaming up the rope. If I would have leaned on that heel horse even a little bit and shut him down, but it never got to him. I stayed up, I stayed up, I rode, 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 got where I was over the steer, and just reached down and roped him. And it's crazy, but if you sit up and let your horse do his job and don't kill all the fundamentals, you're good. But if you're on the ground roping these dummies, developing bad fundamentals, how many people take those fundamentals, get on their horse, enter a big drop pot, and how many of them go out of drop pot in the first go around? 10% or more like 60, 50% of them go out in the first go around. Because I've got to work the kinks out, got to warm up. I don't, that's an expensive warm up session for me. I don't want to have to warm up. Okay, the other thing I wanted to do is make sure that we had small spacing here instead of something that was up six, eight inches so I could bounce it or take it, take it and take it real sharp and not change the plane of my swing. We saw a loop the other night. Ryan Mullins got real high, he came around and he came in like this, trying to get his tip in there while his angle was still so steep, it split the legs like that and he missed the inside leg. It's just a tough shot, you're going fast, mistakes happen. But the deal is, is when I come in here, I wanna make sure that I'm challenging myself, not with six, eight inches underneath there, but I wanna have two inches to where I've gotta get my bottom strand down and go right underneath. And so what I do for timing in my delivery, I look at the left leg, as my tip passes my hand, I put my bottom strand to the ground, simple as that. And somebody learning when to deliver their heel loop, when to let go of it, it's not timing the steer, it's timing our delivery, timing our release. Just like earlier we talked about a kid swinging, well, if we take a little kid, hold him by his hands and swing him in a circle, wherever we let him go, he there will fly. 
And if I wanted to throw, say, I'll say we had just a bag of whatever, apples. I'm going to throw it in your lap. Instead of going like this, swing it, I'm going to swing it, and I'm going to let go, and I'm going to give it to you. Well, if I miss you by one degree or two, he's going to be in his lap. And on the heel side, if we deliver one or two degrees early, our heel loop on live cattle, it's not going to go underneath. And if it does, it's barely underneath. And so you think about how many times you see a heel loop, heel loop laid on the outside, hooking, a, hooking just the right leg. Or worse than that, if a guy delivers really, really late, his loop goes all the way through, and he's over there on his horseback talking about, man, I can't, if I miss that steer, I had three foot sticking out the left side. Well, yeah, you had three foot sticking out the left side because you delivered late, but it also put your hondu right here in front of his back leg, and so he's got this, and on his horse he's thinking, oh, he's done. It's like, oh, crud, missed him, it's gone. So this right here, making you get your back strand, your bottom strand drop behind this leg, and your tip to go in here and cover it is super, super important. If you get ahead in your swing, it's not going to work. If you swing forward to back at all, like the shape of a NASCAR, pushing your tip at your steer. And a lot of guys, you'll see them pushing their, stip, their, their tip right at their steer. They'll get in here and they'll be swinging real hard and powerful, but pushing it at their steer, and it's just gone. Doesn't work. Not on this dummy. But on other dummies, it would. And again, it's a limited loop on live cattle. And where I started challenging myself with this little opening, um, was on a plastic white chair that you stack together, you know, a little cheap Walmart $5 chair kind of deals. Those chairs got one little skinny opening, one that's a little bit wider. And I'd use a little tiny rope, and I'd make myself learn to get that loop inside there. But what it made me think about is back when I was a kid, I'm from Montana. I live down in San Antonio, Texas area now. But I have LCS, last cast syndrome. My family doesn't like going fishing with me because fishing to them is they go, they fish in the morning when they quit biting. They go eat lunch somewhere and have a good time and may come back in the evening. I was a kid that when my mom and dad saw me leave in the morning, they saw me come home after dark. And in the middle of the day, anybody here ever fish cricks? In the Rockies, mountains, anywhere like that? Anybody crick fishermen here? Anyone? Dang, you guys are missing out. When you fish a crick, the open water is great in the morning. Sun's soft, fish are out there, they're feeding, they're hitting. Evening time, they come back out, there's hatches, they feed. In the middle of the day, light in the sun, just like me, my white skin. Where do I go in the heat of the day? I'm running for the shade, and so do the fish. So I'd hunt these fish under banks and tree branches and everything else, but the bridges, my gosh, the bridges, little bridges, farm bridges, you might as well just call them an aquarium. I mean, they were stacked full of fish. And so I had to perfect delivery. So this is my bridge, but my bridge openings were small. So I'd turn around here, just like feeding my heel loop or my head loop to create speed and power, I'd let out some line in my pole, then I'd pull it back just like this. And then I'd start, and I would let it slide out. And I'd start, and I'd let it slide out. And I'd just get ready to get it swinging really good, and I'd think, okay, i got to let that, that weight get over there. And I'd let the weight would start swinging, and I would just drop it. It'd shoot underneath her just like I'd shot it sideways. Bloop, and whoosh, reel them out, stick them in a bread bag, finish up the day, time to your handlebars, and off you go. Good to go, stack full of fish. But in healing, I thought about it when I, that little chair, I thought, that's so similar. I mean, I've got to let my tip my tip get past my hand, past my hand, so I'll say there when I see the left leg, there, 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 and the tip has to go in first, and when it does, it pulls the bottom strand to the ground if I've got the right angle. I was like, wow, that's not so high tech. But for me, it correlated to something in my past that made sense to me. <clears throat> and a little trick you can do while you're here in Vegas, if you eat out, if, how many times a day we have to eat out? Take a knife, so here's the edge of your table. Take a knife, turn the blade out this way. In fact, here, let's just do it. This is the cool engraved knife you get if you buy one of our dummies so they're still here. If I push the blade all the way out to the edge, the knife balances, doesn't do anything because the weight is behind the breaking edge. The breaking edge on a cow is where his flank, his hawk, right? If I spin this knife around and I start to put the heavier side of the knife over the breaking edge, it falls off. In healing, does anybody have a guess where the heaviest part of our loop is? Forward, the tip, or the back part of our loop? Which is the heaviest part? I'll help you here, okay? Let's just go ahead and count the strands of my right hand and the strands of my left hand. There's three, right? Versus two. Hence, the back of our loop is heavier than the tip of our loop. So again, we've got more weight behind our tips. So unless they start letting us put like 
fishing weights on the tip of our ropes and compete, we're always gonna have the situation where the tip has to lead the back of the loop, period. Physics, it's there. If you get a guy that compresses, I mean, just contacts identically, right as it hits the leg, it's exact, and he lets go, he's gonna swing this down and there, might pull a little bit of, of it on there, but you know the biggest thing it usually does? It does a loop that looks about like so, caves on the leg sideways, and again, it's a low percentage shot. So just, again, think of it. One or two degrees difference here means six, eight, 10 inches down there. So on this dummy, it's not gonna let you throw those marginal loops over and over and over and over again, and then you go out on live cattle and you have low success. If you seriously are catching 99% of your dummy shots, but on live cattle you're catching 90%, 10% of those times that you miss when it's in your short go, what does it cost us? What's the value of that? Kid came in the other day, he's like, Waved it off, fourth high call back over here at the World Series. Fourth, fourth, we're open at the World Series here. How much is the World Series here pay? You rope your butt off, you practice your butt off, you got tons of entry money up, and then your fourth high call and you wave it off? I would be having a one spur, one foot butt kicking contest all the way back to Texas. But that's the deal. That's when we're inspired to change. When we have huge breakdowns in a rope and we have a huge problem. We're so inspired we're going to go back and we're going to rope our dummy a hundred times a day now. I'm going to rope it morning and night a hundred times a day. Unless you change something, unless you somehow mysteriously go to find where that loop's at out of thin air, you're not going to catch. You're going to keep doing the same loop that you've always done on every dummy 100% of the time, this dummy is gonna talk to you. You start throwing a bad loop, you will know it because it will not be going over the post and both horns. That's pretty easy to figure out. If that's not there, you did something wrong. You need to work on it. If you hit the side of this body in our heel loop, it's pretty easy. I could be a blind man, close my eyes, get everything right, step up here, Wow, that's pretty definitive sound. Even if I nick it, I know I'm slightly out of whack. Okay? So, just in a recap, we've got the free, the free throw of team roping that we all want to make. We want to make it from the perfect position. Handle, horsemanship, coverage, success of a loop, power, range, tip, drop. Everything's built into this to take our talents, give us toolbox full of tools, and then let our natural ability take us there. And when you practice all the fundamentals and you have them down, it's like a pro baseball player. They just finished the World Series a little while ago, right? Wasn't that long ago? Was it like maybe, what, three, four weeks ago or something, wasn't it? And in the pro baseball, who's the only guy on the team that can suck at batting and still make the pro baseball team? There's only one position. What is it? So the smoker. He can, he can make the pros. A guy can throw the ball from center field to home plate all day long. If he can't read a pitch coming at him at 90 miles an hour to change up, whatever they do, if he can't hit a pro-level baseball pitcher, he never makes pros. In team roping, we don't elevate to those upper levels unless we develop the natural talent to read those situations at high speed. Hence why I do the, the drill where we put the rope on the back of the legs, get the guy set up, and at different speeds, pull the steer to him. Make him rope it on the approach work on those natural skills. You're only gonna go so high. And if you're like me, somewhere in your life, you're gonna embrace the fact that I'll never be an elite. Whew, thank goodness. Cause I sure wouldn't be able to go here for the World Series and rope for more money than a number 10 will ever rope for in his lifetime at one spot. It is a great thing. It's almost a blessing in disguise. But we have to get to that humbling stage and realize, wow, this is me, this is who I am. Now, I might as well get comfortable where I'm at, who I am, my horse, and master this and work on being consistent and giving beautiful handles. Not having to be a superstar, but you know what? One of my, world goal, my life goals is to walk away from the World Series championships with a championship buckle. That would mean a lot more to me than anything else because, you know, the paycheck that comes with that is ginormous, huge. I mean, if you haven't looked at it, then look at the $7.4 million paid out in just those team ropings alone. And look at what the pros rope for here. And they rope for a lot of money here. It's, the, making the NFR for them is huge. But the deal is, is we're really, we're graced with that. We've got more money to rope for in the amateur levels. So why would you not invest in your abilities, your skill set, your toolbox, and perfect those things so when you're out there and you have the opportunity to compete, you don't wave it off the fourth high callback steer.
So this dummy is designed to make true change in your roping. And the cool thing is, we sold a jillion of these dummies last December here when we, when we previewed them. We didn't have anything to sell, so we had as demos. We had orders just long, 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 long. And I have had so many people come to the booth and they're like, I'm roping better than I ever had in my life. I've won so much this year. I won two World Series. I won the U.S. I did this. I did that. I did all these things. I'm catching almost 100% of my cows. Not going fast, but if he's riding right up here to the hip, he ain't going fast, but he's just sitting there sticking it on, doing this, and Dallin's sitting down checking that cow, and the healer's catching. I don't know. Going to the pay window is a lot of fun. And so those guys are having a blast, and they've been up for 15, 20 years, and they're chiseling away at those bad habits they've had their whole lifetime because this helps them find that good loop. So... I want to go ahead and bring a couple of people up, let them throw a few loops at it. We'll do a little analysis, maybe a few changes, and see how you guys rope it. Who's a, who's a header would like to step down here and just throw a couple of loops for me? Okay, come on up. I'm going to play checkers on your boots while you're up here roping. What's your name? Gates. Gates? Yes. And where are you from, Gates? Parish, Texas. Parish, Texas. You know what's so cool? When you want to go on a really fancy vacation and impress your, your friends, you go to Texas because you can go to Paris, you can go to London, and never leave Texas. It's great. Impresses people. All right, let me see what you got here, Gates. European team roper right here. Cut. Let's go ahead and throw another loop. Do you normally rope from that position, or are you trying to widen out because of what we talked about earlier? I'm just curious. You rope pretty wide? Okay. Let's watch him throw one more loop. You are going to love what my dummy would do for your swing and your delivery. Just stay right here for a second. Anybody watch his elbow in his hand where he packed it right here? Came around and did that nice loop that's about this big. Go ahead and again. I'm going to go ahead and take the post out this time. Ooh, a wave off. Jeez, it followed the script. The rope did just what it was supposed to do. Hit our big high shoulder and waved off. Do I want to go and rope a dummy that's going to let me throw that loop forever? No. This time what I want you to do, I want you to get everything ready. Instead of starting your loop from down here and swinging low, get everything ready, and I'm going to change just a couple things. <clears throat> if you watch some of the classic banners, they've got a couple. Of them. I don't know if they have any here, but they have one over the South Point. They've got two headers on this banner side by side, and they look like clones from a distance. When you get up close, they're two different guys. The deal is, those common denominators I talked about in the very beginning, there are certain things that those guys all possess. This is one of them. I want you to stick your hand back here where a waitress packs a plate of food. She's walking around the restaurants. No, get your rope. Get everything built up. Where does a waitress pack? She's got to walk through. She's got a tray of food way back up here, right? Now, what, all I want you to think about here is when we come off this, instead of swinging back and forth and trying to get some momentum to start our loop, if we come from back here up high, look right at your dummy, and you just rotate your elbow over, what are you ducking for? It went right over your head. It's the first time you ever felt that, right? It's, you can go right, it's amazing. It's a magic trick. You don't have to duck. What I want you to do is I want you to swing slow, feed it, and then turn it over. When you see that head through your loop, I want you to say there. But you should be rotating your hand over to where your thumb is completely down. If you see in your swing you're doing this, you need to practice this. There's a reason when you see those guys, their hands cocked like this. They're opening the loop up, swinging. When they deliver, they change that whole thing and rotate it over. So get it up there high. Get your left foot forward and get down. And just come out towards me, swing towards me, and get your rope going and feed it towards me. Flat. We want to go like this. The horns are flat. Now slow it down. Push your hand out this way. Push your hand out. Yeah, just like that. No, no, just push your hand out towards me. Swing the tip towards me. Try to hit my hand with the tip. Reach your hand over here. Re no, 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 no. Keep swinging. He's going he's gonna to hurt me. And I need a helmet like the bull riders here just to handle Mr. Paris, Texas. I want you just to swing, open up a little bit more like this. Get your hand over here. Just push it over towards this way a little bit. Reach your wrist over here more. Okay, good. Now, turn just your head and look at the steer's horns. Now look through that loop, and every time you see the steer's horns up high, keep your hand up high. I want you to deliver when you say there as you see the steer's head. Say it out loud. Wow. So we changed just a couple small little things in his loop, and now he's catching. Wow, that's amazing. You roped the same dummy all your life. You are never going to change anything. A couple degrees in angle change.
rotating our hand a little bit more so we can see the loop. When I leave a kid alone, like these little kids, we had a little kid over at our booth the other day. I mean, little, little, I almost felt like I need to go get him a pallet like we do for little kids. Well, this is a deal for your little, little ones. They'll say, but that post is too hard for him to rope. Get yourself a pallet, put a piece of plywood on it. Not only will it give them a couple inches when they're starting, but guess what else it does? You want to put your kids in a playpen to hold them. You put your kids on an elevated platform, it's instinctual not to really jump off. Those little boys will run around in that square, but they'll stay there. So on this right here, you've got good position. Hands up high, everything's good, you're working that. You figured that out, you're gonna to wanna to practice that till you can do it 100% of the time. The other thing was his curl dropped way over here to the left down here. Is there any front feet down here? Is there any rib cage, like his other loop where it hit up here and waved off? No, so everything's gonna change and everything's gonna get better. Thank you, sir. That's Gage from Paris, Paris, I mean, Paris, Texas. All right, all right, healer. I want somebody to come over and throw a heel loop. <clears throat> Who's a healer? Okay, team ropers, your biggest, biggest thing about lying about your addiction is to admit your addiction to get, get recovery here. You got to admit it. Well, he's laughing. He must be a healer. You a healer? Header? Dang it. Do you heal? Oh, he does. Look at him. He's just staring blank. Come on. Come on up. You know that blind stare. I want to play poker against you. You don't have a poker face at all. All right. Show me what you got. Show me how you swing, how you stand, what you do. Let's take a look at it. Where are you from? What's your name? I'm James from Canada. Alberta. James from Canada, Alberta. You know, when I'm down here in the south, being from Montana, we run into a lot of Canadians, but it's so funny. Whenever I ask them, you want a sticker? And they say, a what? And I show it to them, they said, oh, a decal. And I'm like, a what? They call stickers decals. So it's one of those things. It's A's and decals. All right, James. Good. Okay, throw another one. You know, we hear that nice sound of that plastic, hitting that plastic. You know, we hear a lot of power in your loop. Nice hum. It's got nice steady swing. It's smooth. Anybody here ever good at hula hooping? Any ladies? You know when it's too cold, because where I come from, when it's so cold that they bring the boys inside and make us hula hoop. That's just too cold for PE, I guess, and I, I stunk at hula hooping, but people who can hula hoop well, that's the same thing like spinning a loop. I mean, they just a little bump, little bump, and keep power and speed, power and speed, power, and it's easy to do. So the smoothness of this swing is really, really good. Good. Now, when you drop your loop here, you're dropping it from over here, and you're just freezing everything out. What I want you to do is I'm going to take your rope from you, and I want you to stand right here, put your left foot forward and your right foot back, and stand right there where I was just standing. I want you to get your right hand all the way back up here, just like a bareback rider. Somebody would up there, tied up your left hand's right here like a butler would stand because you're in horse riding position. Now go all the way back. Turn your shoulders back. Okay, when we're swinging back here and you swing down, what I want you to do is I want you to reach down here and just give me a high five. Twist your shoulders. Twist. Twist all the way down. Okay, this all the way down is a complete delivery. Your shoulders when you're delivering are right there and you just stop. You just go like this, you go, perch and just kill everything. And you hold your hand out here over the outside. That amount of rope that we hold up over here is the amount of rope that usually takes to get on the ground and cover feet. So guys that try to place that loop, they go like this and turn it over here, that's a really, really low percentage shot. Now mind you, I've been high on cattle before. I'm swinging over the back, I'm like, okay, he's not moving. My header's rope is running. He should be using our pro dally wraps and it wouldn't be happening. And then I'll go like this and I'll try to place it because I'm high. That is not what I try to do all the time. That's a, that's a horrible deal. So let's, let's do it a couple times. Come a little bit closer, and this is a drill I do. I get my arm all the way back. I look down there at the feet. I want you to rotate down until you touch the inside of that left leg. All the way down. Keep your feet and everything. Okay, do it again. Keep your left hand out front. You're gonna be turning your heel horse completely sideways. Keep your body position here. Just reach back. Now, reach down there like you're just gonna whack it. Don't stop and turn your body like this. Turn your whole shoulders and rotate. Need some power, rotate. Okay, good. Let's build a heel loop back up. Back up a couple inches. You stay right here. I'll move the dummy. Go ahead. You get it where you like it. The one thing about position on the heel dummy, there's lots of analogies, lots of things that are given where people say stand your right foot on the line off the back left leg. People say different things. <clears throat> the analogy I try to use on where to stand when roping a heel dummy, I'm going to start off by asking a simple question. I know the answer to it. How many of y'all like parking an F-350 at the grocery store? Do you drive down the center of the grocery store lane and then try to turn in? No, you'll take out the left tail light, the right door, 
or you'll 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 point park and you'll finally be in. When we stay out wide and give ourselves the best chance to turn in, we're going to be able to get square. And when we get square, we need room to open our doors and get in and out of the car. We don't want to be on that yellow line or this yellow line. I don't want to be so close to my steer that I have to go like this ever if he comes underneath me, even a little bit. If I ever have a steer that goes underneath me, I try to make myself just think where he's going and deliver and wait and feel. If I feel him in there, then I'll dally. The second I lean over and go like this, my horse completely stops, turns sideways, my loop dies out, and if I did catch him, I can't get back to the horn ever anyways. I've got nothing underneath my feet. Okay, so I try to stand just to the left of the dummy in my own parking spot, so to speak. So, okay. I want you to match your loop to that top bar of that leg, okay? Get it all the way down there and match that angle. I'm going to move this out. Get it right down now. I want you to swing your tip at these legs. Right at them. Now, you're just going to rotate your shoulders like you did earlier down and touch that left leg. Okay? When you lead, I'm going to pick this back up for you. When you lead with your hand, it'll hit the plastic every single time. I want you to think about your tip. Your tip hitting it, your tip passing your hand, and then continuing all the way down. When you see this left leg in your loop, just say there. Much like we did with Mr. Parrish Texas, he's dropping his loop a little bit over here to the right as well. So when he says there, and he comes around and delivers it there, his hand and his loop tip is past that. So on your left leg, when you're opening your dummy, if you say there every time you see your left leg, guess where your tip is? Because your hand's over here. That is through. And so if I'm saying there, there, and I let my tip go there, I can rotate over bottom strand down and my tip will be through the legs. So say there, swing slow and smooth, but feel the tip of your rope with your index finger. When, it, when you say there, say there out loud, let's hear it. There. Okay, when you say there, is it pulling on your pinky? There, 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 you feel that little nudge at the bottom strand? I want you to let the tip go in and then set it down. There, there, there. Oh, we dropped it way outside. Starting to look like me now. I live and die by my dummy, if you want to see me get frustrated, like we're getting ready for the NFR and it was heated battle in our office. My secretary goes, let's just go out and rope the dummy. I'm thinking, yeah, that'll be relaxing. Oh, I pelted the side of this dummy like if this was some sort of bullseye like a dozen times before I finally caught it. It was not helping me relax. But the deal is I had to find that loop. I had to swing enough times to get my tip in there. And once I found it, I just wore it out. But if I'm at a rope and I don't have anything to really find that perfect loop and I go wear that out on my first 10, 12 steers, it's a pretty bad thing. So let's do one more. Try to get your tip in there. Feel it on your fingertip and say there as it goes by. Remember, you're going to reach all the way down, nice and smooth, slow and perfect here. There, there. Say it out loud. It's not, me saying it for you is not going to help you. Good. Now freeze right there. You can work on your slack. You should have your hand down here when you're here. But I want you to notice something. Top strand hit, bottom strand hit. And if you would have rotated all the way down, turn your shoulders. Twist your shoulders down. You put the rest of this loop back into this where he was just at. Now we've got coverage here on the back right leg. This is going to stay down. So that drill you're going to be doing where you get across and come all the way through and say there. Much like this morning when I was roping the roping machine over at the arena, I watched, I timed off the right leg, looked the right leg, and I watched my loop go all the way, my hand to the left leg to make sure I had good coverage. So, and it's something too, you know, this is what we're going to do on the ground to take the horse back. When you take your practice to the next level, to me, having this kind of a machine take with me everywhere I go, having myself a hot heel so when I'm in the house, I can either prop the legs out and rope them just out of there with no movement, or I can go ahead and engage the legs, or I can go ahead and put the timing stick on it and practice all those variables, then get onto live cattle. That's a complete package. When you're roping for the kind of money we are here, you should have a complete program as well. So if you have any questions on roping machines or the hot heels, let me know in the booth and I can help you with those as well. So let's throw one more loop and I want you to watch me here. Your pair wants you just to rotate and set it down. Say it out loud. There's a reason that out loud works better, just like a musician tapping its foot to get time. They don't do it in their head because they lose their timing. Okay? All right. What do you think about this dummy? What do you rope at home? Sawhorse? No, uh, just a heel matic Just a heel matic Okay. All right. Well, I appreciate you coming up. Absolutely. Okay. Any questions on this? We're going to go ahead and wrap it up. I'm sure I'm right at my hour, right? Perfect. Um, we're going to wrap this up. I'll be over here in my booth. We're right next to Shoot Help. They're the ones that make the new automatic shoot. If you guys haven't seen these things work, make sure you get by their booth. It is the coolest thing in the world to be able to ride your head horse around in a circle and dump, steers, score.
score, 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 ride your horse out, score, and never have to load a cow. They literally load themselves, close the doors, open the doors, close the doors, and you can work your horse over and over and over again. It's a phenomenal, phenomenal shoot, great concept, and huge in training horses and practice at a small home arena. So if you have any questions, I'll be over here for a minute, and I'll be back to the booth, and I thank you guys for your time today. Ladies and gentlemen, our friend Mr. John McCarthy right there at the Rope Smart Steer. John, we appreciate it. Thank you.